Hello and welcome back to the channel everybody. I am your host Vortex and this is the second episode of the Mobile Music Roundtable podcast. We'll be featuring new panelists here each and every month to discuss topics important to the iOS music community. We usually go for about an hour or two and try to cover at least two or three topics. As usual, there is a ton of great information in here and I just had a fantastic time interacting with everybody. And real quick, I did just want to thank each and every one of our panelists. Thank you so, so much for being on the show. You guys all really killed it here and dropped a ton of amazing commentary, and I can't wait for everybody to hear it. And of course, you will be able to find all the contact information for every single one of our panelists in the description below. And finally, don't forget, we do also want to hear from you, the audience, so definitely make sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below. All right, and now with that intro aside, let's hop right into episode number two of the Mobile Music Roundtable podcast. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mobile Music Roundtable podcast brought to you by Mobile Music Pro. I am your host, Vortex, and this is only the second episode, but I am super stoked to have everybody here because we have some amazing panelists as we try to do, as we try to have always on this show. And uh, before I introduce them, I just want to let everybody know how this show goes for those new that are just joining us. Uh, we pretty much go for about a couple hours. We have a few topics that we want to discuss, and then we go around uh, one by one, everybody asking their opinions on it. So try to have more of a, an open or round table uh, organic type of discussion. So I think it's going to be really fun, guys. But uh, before we do get into the topics, let's go around and introduce these amazing panelists. So first up, we'll go with Mr. Marcus Elbow from Elbow Media Studios. How are you today, bro? I am doing great. I'm doing great. How you doing, sir? Doing good. Can't complain, man. I hope you're doing well. Uh, go ahead and uh, introduce, us, uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Let everybody know uh, who you are. All right. My name is Marcus Elbow. I am co-founder of Elbow Media Studios on YouTube and on the web. And uh, I make tutorials and I create dope ass producers. That's what I do. That's what he does. He creates in a note, dope in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. That's what we're all, we're all trying to, you know, just help uh, basically create more mobile music producers. You know, anybody with a YouTube channel, that's what we're doing. That's what Mobile Music Pro is doing, trying to create more producers. So awesome, man. Really appreciate that. Uh, let's go to yeah. the next person, Mr. Dean from Electrona Sounds. How are you doing, man? Uh, fantastic. Thanks for having me. Really glad uh, to I'm have you. Go, I'm sorry, go uh, thank ahead. Thank you. It's all good. Uh, I'm Dean. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I run a sound design company called Electrona Sounds. Uh, I've been putting out uh, samples and sample packs and uh, synthesizer preset packs uh, since the early 90s. Uh, and I'm also uh, a YouTuber and educator. Absolutely, man. You guys, you guys got to check out Dean's sounds from since the 90s. I'm going to repeat that for for Dean. Since uh, the trying, 90s. This, so this is what I'm about. This is what I'm about. This is the journey for me. <laughs> he's got more sounds than Nutrix has synthesizers. I assure you guys. So make sure you check out Dean's website, electronasounds.com. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Matthew Fetcher from Audio Kit. Matthew, how are you doing today, bro? Hey, man, I'm so excited to be here. I mean, you guys are all YouTube stars. I'm just behind the scenes, just a humble coder here in the you, trenches you, you humble me matthew you humble me <laughs> so i guess a lot of people know us as kind of the biggest framework to build ios apps i mean if you look at the charts probably like one in every four apps you see has some part of my code in there and like apps you don't even know are made with audio kit you know have audio kit and we're kind of behind the scenes like even today in our slack group well uh, you know moog ableton aum brahm you know, we're all discussing like what's going on with iOS and how we can solve challenges and make things easier for other developers. So. Absolutely fantastic, guys. I, I, for those that don't uh, didn't hear that one more time, 25% guys of most iOS music apps are running off of AudioKit. So it is an absolutely invaluable resource to the community. So if you guys don't know about AudioKit and uh, don't know about AudioKit yet, and maybe are thinking about making a music app or even know somebody who's thinking about making a music app, definitely have them check it out because this is open source stuff. And it's really, really important to keep a lot of these uh, technologies open source so that the community and the developers can continue to build and evolve and build on everybody else else's work standing on the, the shoulders of giants as we say uh, so really appreciate that Matthew and all the work that you've done uh, finally we have Mr. Marcus Madison otherwise known as Marcus the fingers how you doing today bro I'm doing good man thank you for having me uh, to be in this group of people who I've literally been following for for years um, and to, just to be in the same room virtual or physical or otherwise with them uh, is incredible and um, 
Uh, for me, yeah, just using a bunch of these apps uh, that these guys have worked on, sounds that they put out, sound kits, um, following their YouTube channels. Uh, uh, Matt, I'm, I'm Matthew, I'm far from a YouTube star, but I post stuff on YouTube and it's allowed me to make some great connections um, in the music production space and the audio production space. Uh, and, uh, and Vortex been following you for uh, however long you had Mobile Music Pro out there. And um, I think you've uh, scoured the world to find all the, the the guys in the mobile production space who have site issues. And you put us all in this room right here together right now uh, um, because we all have vision problems. We all got like, glasses. Let me find everyone with the glasses. Yeah, and you put us all together. Um, but proud to be here, man. Thank you. I didn't notice that. Yeah. <laughs> that. That's Marcus, dude. He's always, he's, he notices the details, man. Really, yeah. really appreciate you being here, Marcus. Thanks so much, man. I think we're going to uh, have a pretty good show today. So uh, without further ado, further ado, I think we can get into the very first topic. Now, this particular topic I did cover in the last show, but I think because this podcast is just starting out and we're only doing one of these a month, I may start the next few podcasts with this topic just to kind of get everybody's opinions, especially if we have completely new people on every podcast, which I'm pretty much trying to do, at least for the first few podcasts, to get as many people's voices out there heard as possible. So uh, let's go ahead and get into that first topic. So the first topic is the state of mobile music production. And for those, again, that didn't uh, check out our last podcast make sure you definitely do that because we we covered that this topic with with, with some other in, uh, very very intelligent and prominent people in this field as well so let's first start out with uh let's, let's go with elbow we're going to probably go around the table here so uh, mr marcus elbow uh what is your thoughts on the state of mobile music production today i think it's in a great place i think that uh the way that i feel that it's in a great place because all of the you know people that are putting out devices for us, computers and everything else Everything is just getting mobile. Everything is getting smaller. Everything is, you know, grab and go. Uh, so, I just think that we're 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 lucky to be able to be the uh, the, the testers. You know what I mean? And it's been going on for years. I know, right? But for us that are pushing uh, the envelope and pushing the product, all of the different apps and all that stuff, and putting them on our YouTube channels, or we're, we're the we're the ones that are, are are ushering in this this new way of making music and this new way of uh, really recording music as well and having a mobile uh, setup and being able to really go anywhere and get some stuff down and get ideas down on a kind of a new user level and also on a professional level. So I think it's it's, it's doing it's doing this thing. I yeah. think a lot of people just have to get used to the form factor. I think when you think about it, a lot of people are just like, well, that's just too small to be able to be that great. But you can use an iPhone and really make some great music. So um, it's just a matter of just ch changing that narrative of small is weaker when actually small can be better and bigger. Absolutely. I think uh, last podcast, we kind of pretty much summed up that the mobile music production state is, is pretty good for software, but for hard, uh, or pretty good for hardware, but the software state is a little uh, a little needing a little bit more love. So, uh, uh, but let's go ahead and uh, go on to the next person, Mr. Dean from Electronic Sounds. Like like I said, during the last podcast, we pretty much determined that um, the, the hardware is pretty much in a good state that's continuing to evolve, but the software does need a little bit more love. So what are your thoughts? Uh, because again, uh, th for those that don't know, Dean does a lot of hardware stuff as well. In addition, uh, to the iPad stuff. So I really am um, curious uh, your opinion coming from a much more of a hardware perspective. Right now with the iOS stuff, I just think that we're spoiled for choice, to be honest with you. I started, you know, bringing iPad into my, you know, setups and productions, I want to say three, four years ago now. And at that time, you know, when I very first started with iPad, we didn't even have like decent reverbs and like there was no like like visual EQ. All of like I found like one mastering tool, like all of the tools that I needed when I first started was like, I hope these come to the table soon. And now I just feel like we're spoiled for choice. Like if I need a reverb, I don't have one awesome reverb. I have a plethora of amazing reverbs on iPad. I've got a visual EQ. I've got mastering plugins. I've got different choices for DAWs or groove boxes. I can use the iPad as a sequencer for hardware, or I can use the iPad to, you know, make music with on its own. I just think we're completely spoiled for choice right now. But I mean, I, being as though that I also have hardware, a lot of the things that I need, you know, come from that world as well. So doing iPad, you know, exclusively and only that, like, I, I don't see anything from me that I'm missing in that workflow. I'm just spoiled for choice, really. <laughs> great, great points. I mean, it is it is kind of crazy where we are right now. There is there is a lot of apps. There's a lot of big companies. I mean, you're talking about reverbs. We have Pro R. I mean, yeah, well, forget almost, about it. Almost what else do you need? 
<laughs> exactly. Like almost yeah, what else? The, piece, yeah. Love it, man. I love, I don't, I, I'm not sure what else you need besides Pro R. I'm sure there's a couple of other creative reverbs, but we really, like you say, Dean, are, are kind of spoiled. And, I, and to be honest, even though we're spoiled, I'm still looking forward to some more apps. I, I still want more. I want, I want more. I want more of the desktop stuff uh, to come down to the iOS. But absolutely great points. There is just a ton of uh, selection, uh, more than enough to get started, right? More than enough. Oh, for sure, for your, absolutely. For your beginner, to even all the I way don't up to see, intermediate. I don't. I, I think for me, that's really the key. Is I don't see any like holes in the work. Workflow. If you want to go iOS, it's like before it would be like, oh, well, maybe you're missing X tool. But now I don't see any tools that you're missing. You've got all the effects from glitches to, I mean, everything. It's all there. It's all available. And typically we have more than one option for each of those, you know, needs. Absolutely. So I want to go on to Matthew now, uh, get his opinion, because I'm really particularly interested in your opinion, Matthew, from a developer point of view. And of course, from audio kit being, you know, 25% uh, of the code out there for, for these music apps. What is your uh, what is your comments on maybe this, the uh, where we are in the state of mobile music production software wise, like uh, stability wise and, you know, maybe what's coming down the pipe, what you expect. Go ahead and give us your thoughts. What do you think? All right. So, you know, that's a big question. It's uh, pretty big. <laughs> we got all the time in the world, though. <laughs> And, you know, gosh, in, in your last episode, I heard some people mention that they felt like kind of was a bit stagnant with apps coming out, not as many. And I think that's kind of an industry wide, like, well, universal kind of issue and challenge where people are kind of fed up with their jobs. There's some study like 55% of people in America want a new job, right? So, I mean, app developers are no different. Uh, but on the flip side, that's also helping iOS because Gosh, over the last year, I've had so many conversations with virtually employees at every major desktop manufacturer from like Ableton to Output to Native Instruments. And there's all people who want to get into making iOS apps and not not their company, but individual people. Oh, and so like, let's think about this, like all the apps that people have mentioned that they want coming to iOS and that you love on the desktop, those apps are all made by people. You know, someone had an idea, someone executed it. You know, maybe these people are just now individuals, but now they're trying to bring their dreams to iOS and like, hey, how can I make this simple, cool tool? And so I think, you know, in 2022 and 2023, we're gonna see a, a cool new influx of apps by these titans of industry, these great minds who are leading great software projects coming to iOS and approaching things from that. You know, maybe that might snowball into them releasing, you know, like their company's projects too. But at least now we're getting input. I mean, like we have project managers from Ableton now, you know, adding open source code that everyone can use. So like having all this new talent come in is going to elevate everyone. And I can tell you as like, so we're somehow we're the developer of the most popular synth on iOS, which is Synth1. And because of that, like... I get a lot of random musicians who contact me, not so much before the pandemic, but I think people just have time on their hands. So gosh, it's like, I think people would be amazed at the pro musicians using iOS, like old school punk rockers, like hard rock bands that are selling out arenas. Uh, like a dude who was like producing the new Metallica record, like sent me an email that he's using like bass 808. Wow. And, and it's like crazy shit, you know? Um, <laughs> and. So Matthew, is the question is are, are they are they talking about it enough though? Do you think it's one of those things where you're like, I don't know if I want everybody to know. Is it a secret because it's a powerful weapon, or is it Ooh. just because people don't think that it's a professional conversation? Marcus, I think uh, you're you're going you're hitting the nail on the head here, right? So it's like it's not cool. So ah, got to change like, that even, narrative. It's yeah, right. So like even like two weeks ago, Jordan Rudis, our Dream Theater released a new record and he used his iPad in there. And like people on Reddit were like, oh, an iPad in the Dream Theater video. That's that's dumb or whatever. But, you know, like <laughs> it's not dumb. It's cool. And it's funny because different markets are different. Like in India, like on they have like a show kind of like American Idol and they have an iPad prominent in their band. And it's cool to have an iPad there. And I think, you know, there's definitely people who are outspoken, like, you know, Mad Lib coming out, like he uses the iPad and Henny, you know, nominated for a Grammy for best hip hop album for, you know, a song he recorded on his iPad driving around East Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like more cool people like that standing up and saying like, hell yeah, I use an iPad. Yeah. I think uh, we need more ambassadors. Yeah. We just need more like people that. like that. To be able to say, hey, this is cool. Check it out. You know what I mean? Because we love to do it. 
I mean, you know, we're on our channels and we're talking about it and a lot of people are interested in it. Um, I, I think that you, you always get this thing. Is it really powerful enough? And I'm not going to sit up here and act like uh, that, you know, in some circumstances, you can run into some uh, some stability issues. But I just think the ceiling is just massive. I mean, I just think it's super hot. Especially if what Matthew is saying is true, right? Which is all these people behind the scenes are actually using the apps. They're just not talking about it yet because it's not mm -hmm. cool because not enough uh, big big musicians, big artists, big producers have come out, right? And, and say that they're they're doing that. So I think uh, from Matthew's perfect perspective, it looks like that that on that onslaught is coming, right? That, that huge, uh, the, the crowd, that huge wave is coming. It's just going to take a, a matter of time, one person at a time, which then snowballs, right? Right, Matthew, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, there's definitely like some bigger names coming. Like I've been on, you know, because a lot of artists aren't touring and their touring future is uncertain, they're looking into building apps. So I've been on calls with, you know, teams of people who represent artists that have just played at the Super Bowl, like major, major artists, and they're, they're all exploring building an app. You know, it's not always audio kit is the right solution, but, you know, they're, I'm trying to help them find the right solution and build a cool app and then having like those mainstream ambassadors you know, it may help, it may not, but I mean, I think the interest is there and people are excited about it. Some, it is now to the point to where some of these large mainstream companies like Ableton are actually contributing open source code, uh, you know, to AudioKit and to these types of uh, iOS uh, music production platforms. So that is really exciting to see because if we have these developers that are all interested in it, these major developers, then we have these uh, growing number of artists and producers that are all interested in it. It does seem that, you know, it is going to crescendo at some point and just uh, kind of all come together and really explode because it does sound like from what you're saying, you are predicting a bull market as, as, as uh, for, for lack of a better word, a bull market in, in more mobile music production apps and, and the knowledge and awareness of it within the next few years. Yeah, I think it's going to continue to get better. And I think it's going to become more accessible for people to create apps. And um, I, I think it's more stable. And, he, you know, sometimes I see online, like, where'd AudioKit go? But like, we're, we're working every single day making things better. Like, Every day when I'm on a call with, you know, uh, like creative arts agency or someone with an artist, I'm like, oh, shit, we got to get our shit together because like, you know, like if I don't want to say a name out loud, like, you know, drops an app tomorrow and it doesn't work, then people are going to dismiss iOS. And so we've got issues where we're like, we allow people to build things in a high level language, Swift, uh, which isn't, I don't want to get too nerdy and turn your listeners off, but it's not real time safe. So Technically, it's hard to get the timing right, but we spent the last few months fixing that in Audio Kit 5. So now we could have like rock solid like sequencer timing and people don't have to learn C++, which is like a huge turn on for even people who made apps even five, 10 years ago. And they're kind of burned out and like, I don't want to spend two years building an app. They can say, oh, I'm going to spend three months building an app with Audio Kit. And it keeps those developers from leaving the ecosystem. Absolutely. And I mean, Audio Kit isn't perfect, but you know, everyone's doing what they can. And if someone makes a million dollars from our apps, they don't have to pay us anything. So it's, you know, that's it is what it is. That's pretty important <laughs> to, keep, to keep in mind as well. So so great, great points, Matthew. Awesome stuff, man. I think we can we need to move on to Marcus. It's been very patient, Mr. Marcus DeFingers. I really want to get your opinion on this because, again, you are, you are a producer, a pretty well-known producer in the iOS music community. You're always entering a ton of contests. You kind of have a pretty good finger on the pulse, uh, sort of what's going on. What, what are your what is your uh, thoughts on the conversation so far and the uh, the overall state of mobile music production? Um, I think for a lot of us, uh, specifically um, for me, I, I dived in on, on iOS production. Uh, I think it was when the f first or second iPhone came in, came out uh, maybe 10 years ago. So Isotope was one of the first that I remember with their iDrum platform. And I entered a lot of their contests and won a lot of their products when they had like RX2 out um, because of the, um, the, they had a contest if you make beats with their app. And I would just make beats on their app going into work every day and upload it to SoundCloud. Um, so that was over 10 years ago. Uh, so always having... Uh, um, that vision and, and knowing that iOS could be where it is today and even further. Um, I really think that a lot of us have always had uh, an ear to that. And then for me, finding Henny's page and really diving in on Beatmaker 3 specifically um, uh, three or four years ago um, because of just seeing Henny out there and, and doing that stuff. Um, I, I think um, to, to, uh, to Dean's point, um, uh, I think it was mentioned that there is a lot of stagnation with new apps being developed and things like that. And I know it takes time for that stuff. Uh, for me, I actually haven't uh, bought an app in about six months um, because uh, I have more than what I need. I probably need to delete some. Um, uh, but over the last few years, especially two or three years ago, I was using this this app uh um, that tells you, uh, called App Slice, it tells you when apps go on sale, and I probably bought like 
200 apps that year because you know when app went to like 30 percent 50 percent off i would just buy it um and i had an alert for all these apps and i bought them when they went on sale or when they were free uh and i downloaded them all and i probably only use like 10 or 20 of them now um so i need to go through and be like okay i don't need seven reverbs i just need you know the, the two or three um and i need to go through and sort of call that list but i think in the future there's a lot more to be done for me specifically recently i've been diving into uh, uh sync stuff um uh, string stuff, a lot of orchestral stuff, and there's still a lot to be desired on iOS for that. I would really like for some of the big string um, libraries, uh, Spitfire Audio, Sonoscore, Audio Imperia, um, you know, name your list, um, to really bring more of their stuff. And some of them are, are there already with like Staff Pad and things like that. Um, but for the high quality string stuff, it will take up a lot of space. And I think the M1 or M2, whatever chips that they decide to move forward with in Apple moving forward is going to be great for bringing that stuff over. Um, and uh, uh, also for AudioKit to, to Matthew, um, I have to um, extend a thank you for, for him and his team for allowing me to uh, uh, beta test these apps and, and create demos. I, I've been able to make connections just because of having sounds on these apps where um, big producers and some of the professionals that these these guys were talking about earlier have like reached out to me on social media like yo are these your presets I'm like yeah man I hope you enjoy them or you know yeah um, so so for me um, uh, even like having the marriage between iOS and producing on the laptop where you can use um, you know like Logic Remote to control Logic or you can t um, connect your iPad to Logic or or any DAW just if you have an Apple at least it's easier um, you can just connect it with through the audio routing and you can play the sounds from your iPad into your DAW and record it I think um, more of that integration um, we'll see down the line especially if Apple brings Logic to the iPad um, you can already do so much with GarageBand um, and the inexpensive yet high quality or free stuff that AudioKit is doing so. I think the opportunities are still there, um, even though right now we, we seem to be in this, what people might seem to or think is like a lull or, you know, there's no new apps, you know, there hasn't been 20 new apps this year. It's like, okay, well, wait in about two or three years. Um, maybe, uh, I don't want to put other stuff out there, but maybe Audio Kit's working on a, you know, an NFT app would automatically turn your music to, I don't know. Um, but, you know, there, there's so much technology wise that's happening behind the scenes that, um, you know, it takes time to develop that stuff. And we're still learning about these new other platforms such as NFT crypto space. Maybe there's ways to integrate that stuff with um, the iOS app app space. So there's there's so much potential. Um, so yeah, it, there might be, you know, every two years, it might be, you know, one year of like, it seems like the, the technology revolution. And then the next year it'll be like dead silence because they're preparing for that next year where the revolution comes back. So um, we just have to keep that in mind when there are those lulls in the technology space. Absolutely fantastic. I like what point. you were saying. Yep, fantastic I like what point. you were saying because if you think about I think some of the the issues the kids are having is that they know the iPads well, but they always gravitate to something that they think it's better. You know what I mean? They think mm -hmm. FL is better. You know what I'm saying? Until yeah. they get a taste of beat maker. Uh and then it's guys like us and, and content creators that are saying, Hey, you know, won't you marry uh, and especially with Dean won't you marry the hardware with, with the software and see what happens? Because, I mean, you could take an, you could literally take an iPhone and use it as a sound module. Back when we were doing music back in the day, because I'm about as old as Dean, I just look older than him. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> you, could, you could take the iPhone. Like back when we were doing it, we had, used to have to have a whole rack of modules, right, Dean? So now you can have, hook up you know, your, your iPad and via MIDI, and you can have, oh, I mean, it's Anything. limitless. Yeah, you know what limitless. I'm saying? It's limitless. So I think that as long as we keep trying to push the, the narrative of, hey, you need to stop thinking that you can't do this just because of what it is. It's an iPad. Oh, man, iPad is not just it's not ready for that. But we just got to keep pushing those videos out there and keep promoting uh, what the capabilities are are and, uh, and, and you know, just being able to, to get in there and really use this device to its full capability. Absolutely. Great, great points by, uh, by both Marcuses there. <laughs> and I also want to uh, say another point that Matthew uh, said as well, because um, he said, remember that these people are um, building things that are going to make things easier for the next generation of developers, right? So that's a big, uh, another important point to remember that, that that doesn't just live in the music production world, that lives, you know, in anywhere when it comes to software development, where people can build tools that then allows them to, other people to use those tools to build more powerful tools, and then on and on and on it goes until one point, we're in the web development world, you just like, you know, uh, turn on Amazon Web Services, 
that's pretty much all I needed to do uh, at this point to run a website. So it gets it's it, it, same as going for music production. Thanks to uh, uh, libraries like AudioKit, where people can just stand on everybody's shoulders, uh, the shoulders of giants, and just keep evolving and building. And what that's going to lead to is, I mean, that's just going to get exponentially uh, better for the entire community, exponentially better for developers, exponentially better better for all the producers that are buying these apps. So when you combine all that with this growing interest, uh, especially as you know, Matthew is saying, there's a lot of people behind the scenes. Uh, when you combine that. that that growing interest with these companies and uh, I think we're going to see some pretty good stuff in the next couple of years and and great points by you know uh Fingers and and Marcus Elbow where like guys sometimes we're going to have a bit of a lull sometimes we are going to have a lull and that's okay we can't be pumping out you know uh the companies just you know the market can't uh, sustain pumping out too many apps uh you know, uh, at once. So I'm really glad uh, where we are. And I think that we've all pretty much agreed that we're in a pretty good state, I think right now for mobile music production, you know, little, little kinks here and there, but really at the end of the day, especially for novices and intermediate people, you, you just have everything at your fingertips. There is no need to have a star, uh, star Trek starship studio anymore. Uh, you just uh, use your iPhone or iPad. And uh, I think people really uh, underestimate the, the screen size even too, like, because remember a lot of Grammy award winning records were made on NPCs with a screen that the size of a stick of gum right so you know it's uh we we are we are kind of spoiled to dean's point we are getting pretty spoiled but look that doesn't mean that we we shouldn't keep pushing so we got to keep pushing but realize what we have guys we have a pretty amazing uh, platform so thank thank you guys so much for that topics i think we're going to move on or for, for that discussion before we move on does anybody else have anything to add before I, we move on? I sort of had one Please. thing to add to that about like this uh, on the state of ios mm -hmm. and like the, it's just sort of just maybe related to like the general age of maybe the users like we're all you know middle-aged dudes or older dudes or whatnot um i look at the you know the viewers age on my channel and most of those people are you know older dudes as well and i'm i'm curious um don't the younger generations these days have ipads i mean isn't that a common thing to have for school and work and study is that people don't is that not a common thing am i am i miss yeah, it really is. It really is uh, kind of fascinating because I think we'll find, I think I've talked to everybody about their YouTube channels at this point. And when it comes to iOS music production, all of our main views are in the older, older folks, like 30 and up. And, it, and I, I can't would, figure it out. Why? Because I obviously would assume that, they get I would the iPads for the, gifts. I would assume that the younger generation who might, you know, just have these devices just on them for school. Think that so. would probably lead it's like way more people to, to find it. Are they not using iPads? Are no, they only they're not. Using the they're phone? not. My oh, kids don't. So it's the I mean, phones. Okay, then let me ask this. The then. phones. Why not? Is it just the too big? It's easier to hold the phone? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the phones are what they're on. I mean, think about it. I mean, my daughter, I have all girls, and uh, the 21 year old, she's, she sings, she's a musician. She, I, I'm giving her an iPad today. Today is her birthday, and she does not have an iPad. And it's ridiculous because I have three. You know what I mean? And it's just kind of like, you know, but their phones are what they gravitate yeah. to because that's what they're on. That's what they live on. Pretty much. Yeah, they live on it. So, but the crazy that's thing exactly about why it, I don't want to use the phone for music. That's exactly why I don't want to yeah. use it for music. Yeah. I want to use something different that I'm not, you know, already on 24-7. Yeah, what's crazy, though, is that I told her in order for me to buy her a studio, which is the iPad studio I bought her today, that she had to use her phone to record her first, her first song. And then she did it and she was like, Dad, I did not even know I could do this. And I'm like, how can you not know that when I've been talking about iOS, you know, apps <laughs> for the last three years? And she's like, OK, well, Dad, I don't watch my head on YouTube. But you know what I mean? But it, I think that the kids today are just they're, they're not thinking about it because their phones are not for that. Their phones are for social media and they want to. That's what they want to do on them. You see what I'm saying? So they yeah, want to. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then when they think about music production, they're thinking what they're watching on YouTube, which is other kids using FL and they're clicking their way. So they're like, OK, that they associate that with that's how you do music, not big studios. I don't even think they look at it like that. I just think they look at it like if I'm going to do music, I'm going to do it on a laptop, on FL. If I'm going to you know, be on my phone on social media, I'm be on my phone. And if I'm going to be a big artist, I got to be in the studio. Wow. 
Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's the momentum for them. Yeah. That's the momentum of the last, you know, 50 years of, of how music and mu- the, the music industry has worked. And I think people, it's, it's still going to take, still going to take some time for, for people to wake up to realize that. But it is true that FL and, you know, these other, uh, and Ableton, they have way more YouTube channels with way more views and way more subscribers, you know, so we're not like, we're not anticipating, you know, iPad to like take over that or anything, but we are uh, wondering like, why, why can't the younger uh, generation see that it's, it's already on the device that they live on most That's of the just- yeah. I think that it's literally so easy to just download and go on the iPad. I mean, there's no drivers. There's no anything. There's no, like, PC is yeah. like a joke. You got to do all this extra stuff all the time. But with iPad, it's just literally instantaneous. I find that the ease of use, I would imagine, would bring in younger people to the platform. And I don't understand why it doesn't. Uh, what would help is if there was someone who the kids fought, like if, if Taylor Swift, Justin Bieber, you know, Drake, Beyonce, pick your favorite artist. Um, if one of those artists come out with an album and say, or this, a song, a single, if Adele says, I made this song using Cubasis um, and here's my new single, like everyone's going to go to Cubasis. So I think it just, you know, one person can can change the the perception of, you know, yeah. one big artist and then let it, if, it, if it's two or three, even, even better. Um, of course, we had Mad Lib, so hip hop people sort of started looking. I, I know Just Blaze mentioned that he used iPad. Um, I know some engineers, of course, producers, Henny, of course. Um, but if like that one uh, big artist, top ten artist, comes out and says, "Hey, I made this uh, this song um, using uh, Beatmaker Three or whatever the case is," um, you know, producers check it out, and then uh, that can open the doors for a lot more people. Uh, and and like I said, there there's not as many YouTube channels. Um, you know, everyone here has a channel, uh, Mobile Music Pro, uh, but there's not a lot really with those um, big followers that are getting the attention of, of the audience, you know, for the mobile production space. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the struggle of trying to get it out there. Um, there needs to be a, a, a reality show on one of these, you know, on Netflix or a Netflix movie about like mobile production or something where, where everyone is watching this stuff. You know, put put uh, make it a game in uh, the next season of Squid Game where, uh, they have to produce a beat using Beatmaker Three, <laughs> and if they don't produce a dope beat or something, you know, they they get eliminated. That's um, so epic. That's yeah, so yeah I, I like your I like your point. <laughs> I think that I don't know if none of the big artists would probably do that because they're probably being realistic that they're in the studio. But I think that you're you're hitting it on the head though, as far as people instead of people saying it's a secret weapon, because I've heard big producers say yeah. that. Yeah, you know, I, I produce on the iPad, but I don't need to tell nobody. You know what I mean? But think about this for a minute. FL used to be the same way. Mm-hmm. You know, think about it. Because I remember when I was using Reason, FL to me was kind of a little for kids. It was a joke, you know. But now people are stepping up. You got these big producers making millions of dollars saying, hey, I click my way to all this money. And it's acceptable. You know what I'm saying? So I believe that the iPad will find its way to the top because it is a great way to make music. I think some of the producers or the, ma- the mainstream producers are feeling like if they say that they're going to give away their secret weapon. And also, and, and, I, did, and I did remember my point because that, that's part of this as well, uh, Marcus, is that I think that when uh, the kids are ready, that it, that it'll be there, right? So that's what's, that's what's important is that it's ready mm-hmm. for the kids. It's ready for everybody, but it's yeah. definitely, definitely, definitely ready for the kids. So whenever they do figure this out, whenever it, do start, whenever it does start becoming cool, right? Like as FL's uh, reputation started to build, right? Uh, as, as iPad's reputation starts to build, the, pl- the platform and the apps and, you know, the platforms and the sustainability will be there. So I think that's, that's a great point. Uh, point to uh and this particular yeah. topic I was kids, it's ready to go some of the kids probably don't even think you can hook monitors up to an ipad so <laughs> nope I mean, yeah. you know what i mean and we don't have enough of those videos uh where we're showing the actual connect connectivity side of it you know what i mean where you can actually have you know studio monitors uh, i've done a few things but it's not i don't think it's being done enough to say okay the ipad is yes it is a mobile device you can watch netflix on it i'm not gonna argue that <laughs> but you can also hook up a mini you know a mini interface you can hook up monitors you can hook up microphones condenser mic anything you can imagine that you can do on a laptop just like dean was saying on, on horrible windows I try, I try to put in my videos like you can see the speakers you know what I mean? hooked up yeah the but, but but again i don't think enough of us are really we're pushing apps 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 you know what i mean let's just be honest you know because 
so for me, I, every time an app come out, I'm loving it. I want to look at it. I want to talk about it on my streams, but I'm never really talking about the connectivity of it. How can you really make this thing really do it? And I haven't done any songs really to really show that, hey, you know, we can show songs all day long, right? And it just looks like, okay, he, they're just, you know, but let me actually see you do it. You know what I mean? Live or make a song or record vocals or put put the stems in there. And I think that's kind of on our end where we need to even push more. I know we're already pushing enough, but as we, if we're going to ambassador this thing in, we're going to bring this thing up to where it needs to be. Then some, we need to start thinking other ways to get them involved instead of just really demonstrating a demo and all the apps because the apps are great. We already know that because yeah, we're yeah. using them every day. But until they're they're actually they actually can see that it happen because the big artists are not going to do that. Because they're not doing that. That's that's just not realistic. You know what I'm saying? If you're you're with a label and you're recording, I mean, they got a big budget. They're going to be in the studio with somebody. You know what but, I'm saying? But even like, they I, go on tour. And when yeah, you go on but, tour, but they got big buses with studios <laughs> yeah. in them, bro. <laughs> that's true. They got you know they got saying? they got the like, studio in the bus. I guess. Now. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Like if if I'm a million dollar producer and I'm big time, I mean, don't get me wrong. I would use the iPad to come up with ideas, but if you know, if I'm in Atlanta, bro, I'm, I'm going to the big time studio just for the experience alone. You know what I'm saying? But this is really, to me, I look at the iPad as a way for you to have a personal relationship with your music. You know what I mean? An intimate relationship. You can touch it. You can yeah, touch it. You know what I'm music. saying? It's so interactive and it's just intuitive and it's easy to use. It's like Dean was saying, you just load the app up and it doesn't take a lot to get it going. If you got a, if you got a good, good enough iPad, it's really nothing you can't really do with it. You know what I'm saying? Really but, accessible, I think. Like really accessible and easy. Yeah. To get, I agree. To set up and get started. I agree. All right. I think that's a great I think that's a great way to end this topic right there. Shut up and get started, people. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we got we, we got yeah. tutorials, we got guides, we got apps, we got videos, we got yeah. sounds. Let's go. All right. So uh, <laughs> I think we can move on to the to the next topic now. So a uh, fantastic discussion so far, guys. I hope you really are enjoying that. If you are, make sure to definitely smash the like on whatever platform you are uh, listening and watching this on because we this, this, these guys are just providing just tons of fire here, tons of gems, and I'm super, super proud uh, to have them on the channel. So let's move on to the next topic of the day, uh, which is going to be AI or artificial intelligence in music. And of course, this is not just uh, for, the, for the iPad too. I mean, we're, we're definitely going to, of course, uh, covered a little bit here in the iPad, but uh, AI seems to be bleeding into every facet of every part of the entire software development world. So, of course, it seems that it's going to come to music, and it really has in these past couple of years. And so, uh, to the point to now, to the extent now, to where people are starting to get a little worried, like, um, am I going to be replaced by artificial intelligence? So, I want to, I want to uh, get everybody's thoughts from this, and we'll, we'll, we'll go the other way this time. We'll start with Marcus uh, DeFingas on this. Uh, what, what is your thoughts on so far on uh, AI and music? Uh, have is it is it a gimmick right now? Is it something to be worried about? Uh, is it going to replace anybody? And have you seen any yourself personally any great uh, any, any great AI driven apps? Yeah, um, one thing I'll say is whenever the AI question comes up, I always bring up this analogy. Um, there, there's good and bad for it, but um, there was a movie that came out, Will Smith movie, uh, probably ten years ago, called I Robot. And in this movie, um, he tells a story. So spoiler alert, um, where um, someone was drowning and the robot. Uh, uh, Will Smith's character was drowning and then a little girl was drowning and the robot saved Will Smith's character because the robot calculated that Will Smith had like a 0.1% chance of surviving more than the little girl and uh, Will Smith's point of telling the story is um, if that was him he would have saved the girl because he knows the human uh, willingness or whatever is is you know able to extend beyond you know human thinking sometimes we have things that that we have powers and things that come out of nowhere, especially um, in certain cir circumstances. So there's there's something to be said about humans having abilities that uh, robots, AI will never have. On the other end, of course, AI can do a billion calculation, calculations and things that humans can never do, um, but everything is by the book. So a lot of times we don't have reasoning in some of the things we do, you know? I might throw a flanger on, on a drum set or drum kit or whatever that an AI thing would never do because it's not programmed to do that. So um, there are things that we do instinctively or because we want a different sound, um, but at the same time, we need that AI. You know, I really like what AI is doing for like mastering or or some of the um, uh, fab filter, fab filter, or isotope things with um, automatic. You know, applying reverbs based on parameters and things like that. Um, I think that's great what those those things are doing. But there's also something to be said about just going with your your gut. Uh, and in some cases, I might use both. I might have a, a AI you know reverb on one thing and then put like my own sort of reverb thing on another. So there's 
there's different aspects. Um, there's things on the iPad that, that help with, with the mastering. There's a lot of mastering and suites and, and um, options on there. Um, uh, I think Tone, Bus Tone Boosters has some AI processing in some of their DAWs um, where you can just put it on a, a, a sound and say like AI, whatever, and it'll it'll do it. So um, I really like playing toying with those, seeing what happens. Um, but then I might put another plug in after that or something before it just to change that sound. So I think having the best of both worlds um, having our sort of our gut feeling, our human uh, intellect or um, whatever we want to do, and then using the AI to sort of support or supplement that. Um, we can sort of have the best of both worlds in that space. Yeah, great points. I mean, if we could have the best of both worlds, that is the ideal solution, of course. And I think that as long as we can keep making AI do stuff that that's good, that AI is good at, right? As long as we can keep making AI, programming AI to do stuff that AI is best suited for, I think we, we should be going in the right direction. Uh, Matthew, uh, really curious to hear your thoughts as a software developer from from this. Uh, what, what's some, maybe some of the craziest stuff you've seen and or maybe what's some of the stuff that you like uh, that, that AI is doing? And, uh, what, and what are your thoughts on kind of the future of, of AI and, and music? Uh, well, I'm really glad you asked me this uh, because, you know, I work in this space and with people that do it. Um, so let's let's... Let's first back up and talk about what AI is and what it isn't, okay? So if we go back like 10 years ago, AI basically was like a set of rules and randomization. And like you're seeing people pass that off as AI now, and I think it's giving people a bad taste for AI. For example, oh man, I'm going to get some flack for this. <laughs> there is like this company that people don't like uh, that... that <laughs> And you know, they, they, they sell chord progressions and stuff and they just released this like drum machine thing and you hit the monkey and it comes up with AI generated drum As soon as you said the monkey, that's now you gave it away. Oh, that's nothing. I, I've heard people talk about that, Matt. And I'm like, man, they, they've been doing that. That's nothing new. Well, well, well right, let's let Matt right. continue because he's, he's, he's getting to the, yeah. to the where uh, we are now. So <laughs> that's, I mean, in a sense, it's technically AI. So like if you go back to game theory and early like Nintendo stuff, you can like, with just a few set of rules, you can simulate complex things like a herd of buffalo or a flock of geese. And that's kind of what they're doing where, well, we know the snare is on the two and the four, and we could do randoms from hi-hat patterns. And is it AI? Eh. <laughs> Not really. Yeah, that's just random. <laughs> yeah, it's just random. Yeah. And so now, like, the people who are serious into it, they use a term called MIR. And... So like there's a big MIR department at uh, Stanford, Karma, and then there's also one in Georgia Tech, which is led by uh, Alex Lurch. And so he's the guy who invented like all the time stretching in Ableton, and he did like the, the pitch recognition in mixed in key and Cubasis, and even Beatmaker 3 uses his code. So he's wow. leading a cool thing. And then Stanford's also just doing some stuff. And I'll kind of read to you like their Stanford's 101 class so to kind of give people an idea of what, what AI really means. And it's, it's to listen and determine what music is, then create chord estimizations and auto sim, audio similarity clustering. And so the first part of that is really important because that's where most people spend their research. And so basically Melodyne is like the ultimate expression of MIR and AI because it's using artificial intelligence to determine, oh, this is a chord that goes with this instrument. And that's where people are focusing a lot. And you're seeing that in these DJ apps where they're separating like these vocal stems really, really well. Really that's well. artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's dope. Like really well. And then, you know, then the next step is machine learning. So it's basically like, so if you're gonna build like this drum machine that's smart, if you will, you want to use machine learning and feed it like a hundred thousand drum loops that you like, and then have that algorithm determine like, okay, I can see like these random human variations and, and use that to create your kind of random drum machine stuff. So and the machine learning can be used for a lot of cool different things. So I don't know if you guys have heard of a guy named Daniel Kuntz. He, uh, he runs Coda Labs. He's like just like 22 years old, super smart kid. And he studied under Alexander at uh, Georgia Tech. And he's doing shit where he's a uh, sorry I curse so much, guys. <laughs> he's gonna get, he's gonna Maybe get me canceled. Aren't watching. Matthew's gonna get Mobile uh, Music Pro canceled. <laughs> I think we're grown enough. Go ahead. <laughs> but so like he's using the iPhone and using machine learning to use the, you know, in the ARM chips you've got this incredible, you know, video and graphics chips that you can't really access from audio, and he's using that to do learning. So 
you've all seen like that hardware thing where you beatbox and it does it in real time to like MIDI. He's doing that with a phone so you can do zero latency like beatboxing, but using the video chip instead of the audio processing using machine learning so that I could tell like, when someone goes that, like that's a kick drum. Wow. So that's like another example of AI and like where it's going. So this like, oh. so when people talk about AI, it's not just like making stupid chord progressions, like the one, four, five or the drum beats. It's like recognizing and then like, what can we do with this next? And that's kind of the whole thing is like, well, yeah. So if you're in 12 tone scales, it's easy to come up with like, you know, a hit chord progression, but that's not really the cool stuff. I think the cool stuff is like, Oh, can we get to the point where, you know, you're playing live on stage and like you make sure that you play in time and hit the right notes, you know, and just this whole variations of like maybe like, you know, like the MIDI sync changes with the tempo of the live bands, you know, you know how hard it is to like for a drummer to play with a kick, you know, just like <laughs> things like yeah. this out of the box. So yeah. I think that's where we're going with MIR. And, you know, I, I know we're kind of in this weird state where there's all these like, hey, click this button and make this song and the songs always suck, you know, and then some people yeah. are turned off by AI. Uh, but there are people like doing like valid work. And, uh, you know, it's just like anything else. We'll see where it goes. Yep. I got to chime in on this, Matt. It's funny you bringing this up because I just had somebody show me the monkeys, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to get sued, them. all right? <laughs> I had never seen them. I had never seen them. And so somebody hit me and it was like, yo, you got to see this. And I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. So I'm watching this video. And at first I was like, really? Okay, that's where we're going right now? Okay, damn. And then after I started listening, I'm like, okay, yeah, it ain't there yet. You know what I mean? It's, it's cute, you know, but it's something about that human touch that, you know, it, has, it hasn't been able to replicate yet. You know, you can, like you said, you could throw some chords and random, like, okay, that's whatever. But yeah, music is just way more intimate than just a bunch of stuff thrown together randomly. And then you're just saying that's a masterpiece. They're not there yet, but I, I like it. I'm a nerd. So what? I love anything that's cool. You know what I'm saying? But you can't get rid of the humans, though. It ain't gonna happen. And, well, and that's where I think Matthew was talking about the machine learning stuff. Like that's where you can actually start having the machine actually spit out stuff because it can learn from all from feeding it hundreds of thousands to millions and millions of stuff. Um, you know, eventually you will hit a threshold where it should be able to pump out something or at the very least, like just be able to um, maybe assist you somehow, you know, in, in some well, very the, meaningful the day, ways. The, hey, the day when we show up to a jazz bar and you got one guy playing a sax and you have a bunch of nothings back there, but instruments playing with him and he's changing and it's changing with him, then I'll be impressed. That One day, <laughs> I believe. Then I believe. I'll be like, okay, it's over. <laughs> That's yeah. it. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're at a whole new level now. We're you probably, know? A yeah. probably five to 10 years away from that, but I believe that is coming. I mean, there is some, some, some nuts still to crack, but once they, once they finish, uh, once they really, uh, start, uh, nail, nailing down what, what they need to do, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to impress a lot of people, but we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see right now. It's all yeah, and Marcus, they're doing more than that at Georgia tech. They're having the robots play mallets, play keys and stuff in the background, along with stuff by using like the machine learning, what? like, Oh, what's going to happen? and go along yeah. with stuff. So like That's what awesome. you're talking about it's is in actual research development, like real time listening. I'm That's so, crazy. I'm telling you. Okay. I see now I'm gonna have to do some more research. <laughs> I gotta gonna, get my hair from up under the desk. Okay. It's gonna get scary, I think. But but for right now, like like you know, Matthew said, we do have some interesting apps uh, right now that are uh, you know using AI. Uh, really, the, one of the coolest things that I've seen uh, that Matthew mentioned is is the ability to remove uh, stems from a song in real time. That that that's, what that's just that. very useful. That just seems you know very useful uh, for a lot Especially of people. Especially for DJs, yeah, yeah, for all sorts of stuff. Well, yeah. So let's uh, let's go with Dean now. Um, Dean, what are your what are your thoughts so far on the conversation and AI and, and everything that Matthew said? What do you, what do you, what do you think um, uh, of AI in music? Is it uh, is it coming pretty soon? Are are you using any AI apps and do you think you'll ever will? I'm not using um, any AI apps now that I know of really. I mean, I'm using uh, Ozone 9 sometimes. I'm using uh, the studio version of Mixed in Key, um, which just means that I can run it as a plugin in Ableton and see like the notes and chords and whatnot that are coming in. But I'm not really sure that stuff is like AI so much. Um, and what I'm really into actually is just randomization in apps really. Not like not the drum monkey stuff specifically, but like any app that can spit out like a randomized result that I can then judge 
take away and then maybe um, you know use as my own. I a lot of people like aren't into randomization stuff because they didn't like write everything like conceptually, but I don't look at it that way. I'm looking at that stuff as more of like collaborative stuff. And I definitely want to bring in outside points of view or when I'm trying to create my music. Um, and, and I think we all are, we all have outside influences and stuff that's, you know, um, you know, from experiences that we've been through. And when you can bring in a little bit of random to your stuff, I think that's really awesome because it helps me generate stuff that I wouldn't generate on my own. Specifically with iOS, I'm getting a lot of use out of the Riffer app from uh, Audio Modern and the Playbeat app from Audio Modern. It's a brand new version of that that's just insane as well. Um, but I don't really use a lot of AI stuff specifically. Um, I've heard a few attempts at like AI trying to recreate like orchestral stuff. Um, it sounded kind of interesting, maybe more like jazzy and avant-garde type of music. Um, but I think we get those kind of results with, you know, random as well. So I, I don't know. I kind of think those two and those two things sort of go hand in hand together. Um, I think in 10 or 15 years, we probably will get AI that's writing like full on albums and people are liking those albums. I don't think it's going to, you know, write lyrics and sing those as well. I mean, maybe Man. there's, you know, there's, I know there's, you know, some, <laughs> some apps that do that, but I mean, you know, the lyrics that it's going to generate on its own, I'm not so sure about that. You know what I mean? But I definitely think it's coming as far as like, AI generated stuff completely, you know, I don't think it's going to phase out musicians, but I definitely think, you know, it's coming and bigger and bigger and bigger, you know. Great, great points. I think what I really wanted to, to get a, um, a takeaway from this convers from this particular topic is that it's I don't think AI is something to be afraid of. I think that Dean hit it the nail on the head there where it's if you look at it like a co-producer or a collaborative type of environment, that's really that's really how you should be looking at it. You shouldn't, because I mean, even downloading, you know, chords from, from other places and packs and things like that, that's also, I mean, some people look at it like, oh, I didn't write it. But most it's, people these days, you know, we look at it like like it is a co-producer, like it is a collaborative person, like it is another uh, person helping us make our music. And hey, if you want to do 100% stuff yourself and draw in every single note and, you know, whatever you want to do, like, that, that, that's fine. But, but there are that's options. That's fine too, yeah. But there but, are options. But yeah. there are options. I think that's what I really wanted to make sure that, that we get a takeaway from this is that to look at it like a collaborative experience because the amount of, of, of stuff that people are trying to make and making successfully right now is pretty cool. Like the Playbeat app and the Riff Rap, those are no joke. Those are cool. You can you can really do some some interesting stuff. Is it going to spit out a new Taylor Swift song? No, no. It's yeah, not going to. Probably not. No. <laughs> <laughs> is it going to give you some interesting melodies or some interesting patterns and things maybe to, that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise that you can then tweak and make your own? Yes, I think, I think it will. So uh, really Really, important, really great points, Dean. Really great points. You know, you know what I'm thinking though is from an artist standpoint of dealing with a working with a producer, um, I could see that kind of weirdness happening, uh, where maybe the artist is second guessing or not really putting a lot of value on the producer if they don't know how the producer is creating the music. You know what I mean? And if you're if you're just doing a bunch of random stuff and then you're putting all this stuff together, you're not now you're not a producer, you're a director. You know what I mean? Right, right. That's kind of debatable too, because really, I mean, the, the amount of power that we have on our computer, mm -hmm. what aren't we? Right? We're writers, producers, uh, you know, directors, I understand. You know, video I understand. editors, right? But so. are you gonna pay? Are you gonna pay a thousand dollars for a beat that you know that you may feel is AI versus someone coming up with it himself? Well, it depends. Most likely, the producer won't tell you if it was That's created what I'm by AI. But again, but, but again, if it's good, it doesn't apps, matter. If it's good. if they know those apps are out there. Right. You know, now and, it, and then if it's an abundance now, if you're talking, we're talking years from now. Now we're not sure. talking now because, again, just yesterday, I didn't even know the monkeys were there. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, five, 10 years from now, the business is going to be a little bit different. You know, unless you're in the studio with, with the fingers and he's in there playing, you may add a different value to what he's worth. You know what I mean? It sounds weird, but think about it for a minute. You know, if, if he sends me a beat and I'm listening, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's cool. I like the beat. And then I say, well, you know what? Can you come in and play it? And then he's like, uh, you know what I'm saying? And then you're like, okay, so if you didn't play that, it's a sample. What is it? Well, I use AI. And then now you get into this thing where it, to me, it would devalue, you know, his position. You see what I'm saying? As a, but we're talking about from artists, from us producers. We're like, yo, I'm going to use whatever. If it's hot, it's hot. What the hell are you talking about? Just grab what you know I, what I mean? 
You know what I'm saying? But I just, you know, dealing with all these young, the few young kids I've been dealing with, with the beat battle and things like this, one thing that I noticed towards the end of my show is when I started trying to put producers in positions where, okay, you may have did a, a whole loop uh, beat the first time and you won the champion. You became a champion. Now at the end, I'm going to make you do a beat that you're probably, it's probably going to be out of your comfort zone. Then I'm starting to notice now that the pressure is different. Now they're feeling different. Now they're like, okay, they're asking questions that me as a producer, I wouldn't ask. If I asked you to do a pop beat, now you're saying, well, why do I have to do that? Okay, I'm sorry. Why is that a problem? Are you a producer? Is that not your niche? What, what is the deal? You see what I'm saying? So that's my way of saying you're a producer or you're just somebody that's using a bunch of loops and you're just trying to, you know, put a bunch, you're a director. You're putting all a construction worker. You're putting all of these things together. You're good at that. But if I ask you to put some specific together, you're, you're freezing up because you're not really a producer. And I think that's where that gets weird because if I'm hiring you to do an album and I say, you know what? I don't want you to just send everything to me. I want to meet in a studio, meet me in Atlanta. We meet in Atlanta and then I'm looking at you and you're using a bunch of monkeys to generate my music. I'm going to be like, what the hell I need you for? Yep. I think that's some some great points. So if that's something to be afraid of, I would say that's where it would get weird on the business end. The music is always going to be music. We listen to music. We consume music every day. I don't ask myself when I'm listening to chords, where did it come from? (laughs) You see what I'm saying? But I'm also not paying $1,500 to listen to it either. You see see what I'm saying? But if I'm paying you $1,500, I'm kind of feeling some type of where you got that from. Did you do that? Or did you use some monkeys from Eunice? Okay, I ain't going to even say it, but (laughs) you know what the hell I'm talking about. Because if you did that, I'll give you $500 for for coming up with the, the, you know, whatever and putting it together and mixing it. But yeah, I'm not going to pay you $1,500 or whatever. And I think I'm not going to touch on it too much, but definitely uh, Marcus is definitely getting into the producer slash beat maker debate, which we're not going to cover here today. But that would be like an example of like a person who, you know, only makes a specific kind of a uh, song in a specific type of genre versus uh, a producer who who not only makes songs in multiple genres, but then, uh, you know, gets uh, parts and pieces of it from, you know, hires a hires a guitarist, then hires a pianist and then puts that all together. You know, that's kind of more of what, uh, you know, a producer is um, traditionally referred to as. And so I don't want to get too much into that de- debate, but that is where this AI stuff can start to get kind of weird. It can kind of kind of exacerbate that a little bit, that debate even a little bit further. It's like, well, did you did you use AI or did you like, you know, did you play this in? So <laughs> yeah, uh, Is AI going to be in the credits? Probably not. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't know. I, I, I mean, that's actually the thing I like about AI, um, specifically to, to what Vortex just said, actually about like hiring like a, a piano player or, or a guitar. There's, um, I really like what what Logic has done. Um, I think it's also in GarageBand with the drum the drummer. Sometimes I, I I program my own drums, but I layer it with the AI drummer for fills and stuff because they have that human element in the robot in the AI programming with their drummer stuff. And um, yeah. I'm sure there's apps that have guitars and piano players AI that do that. Um, you know, if not, you know, someone give me a call. Mark is on the call. He's the- the best keyboard player in the business. <laughs> oh, no doubt. <laughs> no, no doubt. doubt. All right. Uh, I think, uh, I think, Abel, I think you already, we, we, you were next, but I think you've already said what you wanted to say on this topic. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm good. Okay, cool. Yeah, Marcus, think- you know, I really appreciate what you talked about because it, it, it sparks some, this idea, like in the future, producers may be more of curators and like known for their ear. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like, it's almost like Rip Rubin does now. Like he's not making beats anymore. He's just like nodding his head and like, that's it. You know, <laughs> yeah, so no like question. I would pay Rick Rubin like ten thousand dollars to like play around and make some AI and say like this is your hit. Like yeah, I don't care no how problem. he made it, he just right. he got the ear. You know, I pay Rick right. Rubin to do anything. That's but a good point. That's, <laughs> that's that's a good point. And you know what? It, you you hit it on the head, Matt. Maybe five years from now, ten years from now, it's understand. It's understood. You know what I mean? Like it's accepted. So it's just like yo, I'm just gonna hire Dre to just come in and nod at it. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> me in the studio and just be like, yo, random, let me hear it. Oh, yeah, that's nice right there. Yeah, that. <laughs> you got a keyboard AI? Okay, play it. Oh, that's nice right there. Just put it. And then you just start putting all this stuff together. It's like, that's a hit. Let's go. I'm gone. Hey, I'm going to send you send me a check for $50,000. <laughs> and then you just leave. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, may, it will probably be accepted, just like we're accepting streaming. You know what I mean? Before, it was like, yo, if I'm not selling a physical album, it, it doesn't mean anything. You know, now it's everybody's like, I'm not, well, why am I going to buy an album? You know what I mean? Now you got 50 year olds saying, man, I'm not buying an album. So I'm just going to stream. It. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, I swear to God, five years ago, the guy was like, I'm not going to pay $5 a month to listen million, to a million songs. <laughs> you know, now that all of a sudden is the smart way of doing things. So I, I just think things are going to change as technology gets better. 
Absolutely. You have great points. I think we definitely uh, uh, finished this topic. Uh, we, we definitely did this topic to death for sure. I think we had amazing gems in here. Uh, just great points from everybody all around. So thanks again, uh, everybody, for your for your discussion. That was really great. Uh, let's move on, I think, to our third and final topic for today. This uh, third and final topic we're going to talk about today is kind of a little bit uh, like the first topic of the state of mobile music production. And uh, I, what I want to talk about is how can we... Um, or do we need to get more numbers being disclosed uh, by more and more uh, by more of these companies in the iOS music production uh, industry so that we can figure out where the heck we are? Because where, where we are right now, it's, it's getting a little bit difficult to gauge how many people are actually making music on the iPad or iOS devices. It's getting a little bit difficult uh, to gauge how many people are using Cubasis and how many people are using Beatmaker and things like that. So we're getting to the point, I think, in the industry where we start, we're going to start needing some of these numbers, like, for example, how many copies of you know, Cubasis did Steinberg sell so that other companies can see what type of market and what type of market participants are in there and things like that. So I'm actually going to start with uh, Matthew on this one. Uh, Matthew, what do you, what are your thoughts on this particular like, topic like, tell me all the sales numbers i want every single sales number from <laughs> every audio single kid. person no, audio kid. Ever, <laughs> well hey what was that other topic <laughs> go ahead Matthew's just... all right, Matthew. go ahead bro uh, 808 how many sales go go but no so i don't want so i'm not asking for, uh, you right now real. just so you... i don't know if that's realistic though just, uh, yeah well just to keep, i don't know if that's realistic well just to keep, keep so just to make sure you know matthew i'm not asking for specific numbers right now but like for example in the desktop music world like how how, how is it different you know how, how do um does ableton disclose any type of numbers you know like you know like we talk to steinberg once a week or so and like everyone everyone talks to everyone like everyone knows kind of how people are doing so it's not a matter of like oh, I need this, this, and this. I guess let me rephrase this without <laughs> giving anything away. <laughs> so the big it's challenge isn't right. really sales so much as, okay, there's a couple challenges. One is staffing, right? Because there's only like three or 400 people in the entire world, like building all the apps from native instruments to Ableton to Cubase to Cubasis. Like it's, it's a very small talent pool. And so if you want to support another platform, well, then you have to find these people and you have to find people with iOS skills. You know, you know, I can get a job for $140,000 a year in Atlanta working for like Peloton or Pandora, or I could work for $80,000 in Ableton in Berlin. So like people are going to take the, you know, <laughs> the easy money stateside. Uh, another challenge is just like a lot of these legacy uh, programs were built before iOS even existed. So like then they were architected in a certain way. So it's really hard to go back and change it. Uh, but what companies are doing instead is like realizing that iOS is great for marketing. Like for example, okay, I'm trying not to get in trouble here, but so let's say we have this company called Herringer and they're making cheap knockoffs of your sense. What if you could make a low cost or free synth for iOS. And then that was like, instead of spending half a million dollars on Facebook ads, you could spend that on your engineering team as a loss leader. So a lot of people are looking at iOS as like, hey, what kind of cool apps can we make that would be kind of like marketing or add to the conversation? And that could also be useful. And maybe they can support themselves, but they probably won't, you know, it's kind of where people are at. But I, just, I think we, maybe we can almost rephrase this topic as like maybe some of the challenges that we still have uh, to getting, you know, iOS music production uh, bigger and bigger. And that that's just great points, Matthew, about how there's actually only a few hundred people in the whole world that are that are that are developing software for any platform when it comes to specifically music production and music stuff, because this is rocket science stuff when you start getting into the nitty nitty gritty. So you really do uh, you really do need some some people who know what they're talking about. But go ahead. Elbow, uh, you had a question for yeah, I got a question for Matt. I'm, I'm glad to, you know. We're sitting here talking, but we I, I've forgotten that fast that match behind the curtain. Um, I mean, are people really taking iOS seriously? And not because you're creating apps, because I get it, you know what I mean, from a business standpoint, but just from a realistic standpoint, from where you're sitting, do you feel like it is being taken seriously? I think it is. I think it's, you know, it's like one of those things that people want on their list. Like there's, gosh, like there's like, code right now that people are running on iOS and Mac that could be ported to Windows. They just don't have the manpower. They don't want to deal with all the little intricacies. Or maybe they have a certain way of selling things to their stores and they have to deal with accounting and giving Apple 30%. And so it's just like, 
I think, you know, right now people are, are focusing on, okay, here's another thing. So like Apple Silicon has made it very hard for desktop developers and a lot of headaches. So then they, they don't want another headache on top of that of having to support another platform. Even if they have, there's some companies that have the code, they could like flip the switch and run iOS, but it's all this other stuff that makes it kind of a challenge. So I don't think it's a matter of people are saying like, oh, it's not powerful enough. It's just like staffing and just like just an industry wide thing. And, you know, people but, might call me out and be like, ah, well, but I guess what made me ask well, it's something like was, logistics. It's something like logistics is yes, like yeah. the main yeah. um, kind of yeah. kind of buried entry right now for the average company trying to get into iOS. Because what triggered my question was when you said it's cool to make an app for iOS. You know what I mean? Because not not gimmicky, but just cool. Like, yo, we do that on that. That's cool. You can touch it. You can play. It's a good marketing tool. Right. You know, and developers have. You know, and the execs, they have an iPhone in their pocket. They want to see their company brands, you know, in people's hands. Yeah. Uh, but the, the idea of like taking a 20 year old code base and adapting it to this new technology, <laughs> you yeah. know, that that's a, yeah. a lot of money and effort away from their already goals. And like some companies are being acquired and reorganized. And, you know, there's just a lot of conflicting directions. So. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All right, uh, let's go uh, then with uh, Marcus DeFingas, and then we'll go back around. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on maybe like uh, Matthew's, uh, uh, Matthew's comments and kind of some of the challenges left uh, for the iOS ecosystem to go through uh, some of the things we still have to, some of the hurdles maybe we, that we still have to go through? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't, uh, to, to what Matthew was saying, I don't know if it's a, a numbers thing. We don't have to know like how many sales of something, um, you know, is of an app or a music production thing. I just think there has to be awareness out there. There's, um, I, I work with, um, I do a lot of demos for companies and um, beta tests, a lot of stuff. And um, sometimes they ask me like, who should we send this to, to get word out? And I have a list of uh, 50, maybe even hundred now YouTube um, music producers who I say, send this to them and, uh, you know, tell them, you know, ask them to make a video about it. Uh, they have hundreds of thousands or millions of subscribers, whatever the case is. Um, and, you know, just have them do an honest opinion. Don't tell them they have to give it rave reviews. If they don't like it, let them say they don't like it, but send it to them, see what they say. Um, and there's a, that pool of those hundred or so people is a lot bigger for the desktop applications than it is for iPads. So it's, it'll be a lot harder. There might be what, 10, 20 people uh, in the iPad space and probably fewer with hundreds of thousands of view of, of subscribers um, that can have that kind of impact in the iOS space where it's like, hey, review this iOS app um, and, you know, put it out to, to your following. Um, there's not as many, uh, as far as I know, uh, there's, there might just be a handful. Um, so uh, I think to what you were saying earlier, just having the content now, um, because right now to, to what Marcus Elbow was saying, um, right now uh, the iPad production space is where like Reason and Ableton and, and Logic was five, 10 years ago. That's the newcomer to the space. So in five to 10 years, um, the tables might be flipped. iPad production might be the big thing and uh, all the desktop stuff will, might, might be sort of the second tier, but um, we don't know that. And I think for companies to what Matthew was saying, um, they don't really know, like, should they invest a hundred thousand dollars in creating this um, iOS platform? It only to make ten thousand dollars a year. That's not a you know business uh, uh, savvy like argument, but it could be an investment they can make now uh, with you know a three year goal and say, hey, within three years we'll have our money back, and then we'll be you know um, uh, in in uh, in the green, so to speak, or in, in the uh, in the black. Uh, but yeah, there's um, uh, I think there's a lot of things to consider for these companies that don't have a lot of staff. Um, uh, it's great with what, what Matthew's doing with audio kit to sort of come out the gate with the iOS focus and not, um, you know, have the desktop. Actually, I would love for a lot of the audio kit stuff to be on desktop, <laughs> um, like the 808 stuff, but, uh, to have that focus on iOS first, um, I think if, if some of these companies could either, um, continue reaching out to, to, to Matthew and audio kit to say, Hey, how can we do this? Um, like logically for our company and, and still have that offering. Uh, I think that'll help raise that uh, pool of producers that use iOS products. Yeah, and I was thinking not exact numbers. I was thinking just like maybe year over year growth percentages or something. Like for example, Matthew, maybe you can like you know tell us like um, uh, how how much your apps have grown in downloads. You know, year over year, maybe for like the past few years or something, to, so we can see some kind of you know uh, trajectory trajectory of some kind. Yeah. So I, I guess I can give you like you guys can calculate <laughs> like how many downloads an app gets. 
So like if an app is number one in the US, it has to get about like 100 downloads within 24 hours. Hmm. That's all. So like if you see an app that doesn't make it the number one, they probably didn't even get 100 people that bought it. That wow. kind of sucks. Wow. Interesting. I never heard like 100? Like yeah. Within 24 100. hours. Wow. But that's just for the US. Now, typically, your other markets combined, they equal the US. Uh, so interesting. Very, well, that's, that's a good, that's definitely a good data point, you know, that we can use to see if we see start seeing more and more uh, music production apps at number one. And of course, pretty much every time you, <laughs> Matthew, you, you guys launch one, you guys hit number one. And uh, oh, yeah, I appreciate those hundred copies sold. Yeah, it almost makes a thousand dollars, right? <laughs> I think, well, I think it's good for people to know that because I didn't know, I thought it was like a million or something that you would need, like literally like hundreds of thousands of downloads to, to get to the top five. Well, here's the thing. If you have a free app, it's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the big things that helped iOS music the last year was when Moog released the Model D for free for, I don't know, a few months. It was such a major news story. I think it was even on like cable news here in the US. And just from like the, those first two weeks, we got 100,000 more downloads. Wow. I think just people going on and searching for wow. the Moog synth. And it's great. It's a great ambassador because, you know, it's AUV3. It sounds just as good as a desktop app. Yeah, and you know, and then like from a marketing standpoint, it really helped cement the Moog brands, and you know, then just like their whole idea of like, hey, we're good people, and even even the other, I don't think it's Korg and Roland, and even the head sound designer of Roland he just gave us some sounds using an app. So I think a lot of them, like if I was in the desktop space, I don't think they'd give me free sounds, right? But they kind of look as iOS is like, hey, this great, fun, loving place where everyone works together and. <laughs> You know, we're all just kind of like promoting music making. And if someone buys a Roland synth or a Moog synth because, you know, we're spending this instead of giving it to Facebook advertising, that's a better investment for companies, you know. Yep, absolutely. Great point. Great point. All right. I think we can go to Dean for, for his, uh, his thoughts on this topic. What do you think on the discussion so far, Dean? Like, um, what, what are some of the hurdles maybe that we still have in iOS music production? And, and, and what are your thoughts on, on some of these numbers? I honestly, I just don't, I can't really wrap my brain around the fact that younger people don't want to use this, you know, more as a music production device. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't quite get it um, because it's just, I mean, like every household has one of these, I mean, or more, right? Just ready to go. You don't need extra stuff. You can just go. It's like, it's, it, it's, I, I can't think of a more perfect tool for beginners to get started with music making production quickly and efficiently than the iPad. I mean, I just can't. But what I, I, what I've been, you know, secretly hoping for since day, since my day one with the iPad is that Ableton would drop their hat in the ring somehow. And that doesn't mean, you know, the fully full, you know, version of Ableton where we can load, you know, every single thing into it and like, you know, serum and contact and all that, but just something. I would really like to see something from Ableton on the iPad. I think personally that would break everything wide open. I mean, just what it would, it would be completely like a dream come true for me personally. And I think really just open the gates to more people. You know, I've I, seen like, I've seen little tidbits here and there. Oh, so-and-so working at Ableton is interested in this or Ableton is looking for people who might be able to code this. Little tiny rumors and little tiny hints that on some level, somebody there is aware of iOS and interested in it. I just don't think enough people there, you know, are pushing it. We'll see. I'm still, I'm still hoping to see something from them at some point. Yeah, that's I me. Mean, I think that's a great point, and I think we 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 said this last episode too. Where like, it, it, if if we just had one of the big three, Logic or Ableton or FL Studio, drop an actual real real DAW multi track recording, you know, I'm every, say, you know, FL drop one. And that well, that, we're not counting that stupid FL Studio. That's not even by FL, really. That horrible, they they bought that, that hurt them more than helped them. Yeah, they yeah, bought, agreed, agreed. Yeah, they bought some other app and then renamed it to FL. So, but if, if, if FL was really to drop or Ableton or or Logic Pro, if if any of these were really to drop any one of them, it would absolutely be like literally day and night. We we went from one universe to a completely different agreed, universe. Agreed, absolutely. Agreed. So I think the I think those types of things they are coming, especially with you know again as Matthew said, there is a lot of interest behind the scenes of this stuff. Uh, it's just a matter of logistics and, and getting and getting it all mo moved forward because we have examples of of big companies in the space. You know, IK Multimedia, FabFilter, and such. So Korg and everybody. So now it's just um now it's just time to take it to that 
next step to that next level. And that means dropping one of the major DAWs, uh, you know, on iOS. I think that would open the floodgates, just like you said, Dean. So fantastic. I want to say something to Dean real quick. Uh, I like what Dean was talking about when he was saying he can't believe it. I, I, trust me. Yeah. Someone that talks about it, because we talk about it, right? And, and I know uh, Vortex can attest to this as well. It's I've had so many people reach out to me in comments and say, I can't believe I can do this with an iPad. It's weird. It's almost like having a pretty girl next door that never comes outside. <laughs> and then all of a sudden she comes outside and everybody's like, what the hell is that? Like, how did I not know she lived there? You know what I mean? Because, I mean, a buddy of mine, uh, he's just got into producing. He's never produced before. And the first thing he told me was, I cannot believe I made a beat because you got to remember coming from where we come from. And that's, you know, 35, 38 and up is that it used to kind of be a little chore a little bit. You know, you either have to have a computer, you had to have this, uh, again, I'm picking off what Dean is saying, the ease of use. You had to have all these different components in order for you to be able to make a beat. And most people, you know, I think the older people are so amazed by it because again, everybody's not tech savvy as like us in here. So when you're like, not tech savvy, and then someone shows you something on YouTube where you can just go get your iPad that you got three years ago for a gift, and you can buy BeatMaker 3, and you can use plugins like, you know, some from Audio Kit, and then all of a sudden, in a matter of two sessions of sitting down watching my tutorial, you're actually making music. It's almost like magic. And for the older generation, they get it because they can appreciate that mm. process. Because they know what it was like when they was in the studio and they may were just rapping. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they were watching producers and they're like, I will never be able to do that. <laughs> you, you know what they, I mean? They see watching the Star Trek, work with the, the Star Trek yeah, studios. It, exactly. So I think that the iPad is just we're we're I think that we're I know where you're going with your question, uh, Vortex. How do we get the word out? How do we know what's really happening, right? But we kinda know because there's not enough people talking about it. Because the way we feel about it, everyone should feel that way about it. Everyone should be like, you know what? I'm using my iPad to make beats. I'm not going to buy all that crap. I can spend $15, $20 on some apps. I can spend $30 on a doll, and I'm going to do everything right here. Why would I go spend five, six, seven, you know, $5,000 on a new rig and do all that when I can just do it on an iPad? To me, it's the most amazing way to make music. Absolutely. But Absolutely. Just point. don't know. That's all it is. They don't know. I, I think it's they just don't know. I was having similar discussions with, you know, in podcasts like this one in the crypto industry many years ago. And, you know, we were kind of saying some of the similar things like they, people just don't know. But when they figure it out and they see the magic of what you can do with an iPad, when they see the magic of what you can do with a new technology, you know, like any technology, it takes time to implement. People always just, uh, underestimate the first 10 years, you know, uh, look where we were with the Internet in 95 after 30 years of it being in there. We, we just then got e-commerce. So I, I, I'm definitely patient and I'm, I'm here for the long haul. So I think uh, I think people need to understand how early days it is to uh, for, for the I, iPad music production, because I hear a lot of people are like, look, I, I've been here for 10 years. There's barely, new, you know, I'm still waiting. And it's like, guys, we've accomplished a ton of things in the last 10 years. And the next 10 years is going to be even more insane, I can guarantee you. So uh, just a matter of time, in my opinion. But I think that's a great way to end it here, guys. Uh, fantastic podcast so far. I want to do the outro and ask everybody uh, where we can find out more information about them. Uh, so Elbow, we'll start with you first, man. Thank you again so much for being here. I, I really, really appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy, man. So just let me know, uh, uh, let people know where we can find out more about you. <clears throat> you can find me anywhere on, on the web. Just type in Elbow Media Studios and I should pop up with my big fat head. And uh, yeah, besides that, uh, yeah, like I say, anything, all the social media, Elbow Media Studios, Marcus Elbow, you can find me anywhere. And guess what? I appreciate being on with you guys. We have some great discussion, man. This is awesome. We keep doing stuff like this. They're, they're, we're going to get the word out, no question. Absolutely, man. Don't 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 lie. We know you're a lady killer, bro. We, we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm one lady killer, 27 years. Watch it. <laughs> all right, all right. Hopefully the wife ain't watching. All right, let's go. Yeah. Let's go to Dean. Where can we find out more about you, sir, and all the crazy, amazing decades of stuff you've done, sir? Uh, you can find me at electronasounds.com. You can find me on uh, YouTube at electronasounds. You can find me at Facebook, Instagram at electronasounds. Um, yeah, had a great time being here, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. To totally had a great time. Just again, guys, make sure you check out everybody's channels here. Uh, Dean has been doing this for so long. Tons of videos, album media studios, tons and tons of videos. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, hundreds of videos between us all. So make sure you check out uh, these guys' channels. All right. Uh, Matthew, where can we find out more about you, sir? 
uh, audiokitpro.com. And uh, thank you for letting me share everyone's secrets and tell everyone how the sausage is made. I won't be allowed back. <laughs> I won't be invited to any more conferences now that I've uh, you know told everyone how it works. So. I already got to bleep out a couple of stuff you said. So, so I, you already cost me some extra editing work, but it's okay. We, we, we love you, Matthew. Man. Thank you for everything, man, that you, that you do with Audio Kit, bro. I mean, I know that there is tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people worldwide uh, that use your stuff and, and just super are super thankful for um, the 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 tools that you guys are building over there, and like like I said earlier, you know, um, the audio kits building tools that then can inspire other people to build tools on top of that, and then it just keeps going on like that. And when you start stacking that, one day, you know, you'll you'll have some. One day, you'll be able to create a music app in a weekend, and that's pretty much I think where we're going, just like where we went with every other technology to be able to bring it down to the accessibility to m almost anybody uh, can start creating some really really good stuff. And I uh, really really appreciate everything that you're doing over there. Make sure everybody goes and checks out Audio Kit Pro. Dot com. Make sure you follow Matthew, of course, on all of his uh, socials as well. So, uh, Mr. Marcus the Fingers, last but not least, bro, where can we find out more about you, sir? Uh, last but not I'll give you two links. Uh, Thefingers.com is the easiest one, uh, D-A-F-I-N-G-A-Z.com. Um, but the second link is actually uh, a new replacement for all of you guys to check it out for your link in bio. It is Koji, K-O-J-I dot T-O slash Thefingers is my link. So Koji, K-O-J-I dot T-O slash Thefingers. Um, is mine. It's basically a new link in bio platform. I'm going to do a whole video about it, but it basically allows you to um, have links. And it's basically like a new version of um, link in bio, uh, but it's a free version of like Linktree, link in bio, any of those platforms um, where you can build games on there. You can sell products on there um, all for free. So not for that, but Koji.to. That's a perfect example, Marcus, of like, you know, where, where what happens when you when you keep evolving technologies, you get uh, the website that you talked about and you have everything in there. I'm talking about a store, a, a, a blog, a membership, you know, all, all sorts of stuff, all built into one little thing that anybody can just sign up for and uh, and have all of those features. So I, that's really the, the vein that I think, uh, you know, Matthew and Audio Kit is is really bringing to the table is just bringing these technologies so that eventually everybody can can just make more and more stuff easier and easier. And uh, really, really just excited to see what Audio Kit is going to bring out in the future. But this is this is where where we are people we are still early days but there is still some amazing amazing stuff to come and i'm really super excited about the future so thank you guys so so much for being here again these people don't get paid to be here guys i'm not i'm not paying them so please please make sure to check out their links please make sure to follow them and check Wait, out we're not website. being paid Did you guys know about this <laughs> see now matthew's never coming what? back because he <laughs> <laughs> oh my all right guys i hope everybody has a fantastic day and week and month and year guys please uh make sure you follow mobilemusicpro.com and until next time everybody keep talking music we'll see you guys later Bye bye Hey everybody, Vortex here, and if you're not aware yet, we now have over 100 fully edited mobile music tutorial videos. And we make music every single Wednesday live on our channel right inside of Cubasis on our iPad. Plus, we also have a bunch of free sample packs, guides, and more at our website at mobilemusicpro.com free. And so if you are into that sort of thing, producing music on your iPhone or iPad, then definitely make sure to subscribe and check out the rest of the videos on the channel that we know you'll love.